When you start seeing things in terms of patterns rather than technical details, you've opened your third eye. You will reach a new level of consciousness. Whenever I learn a new programming language, the first questions I ask myself are, is it statically or dynamically typed? Is it strongly or weakly typed? What's the paradigm? Is it object oriented? Is it procedural? And there's a few other questions like how does memory management work? Is it like garbage collected? Is it compiled? Is it interpreted? And the reason is that when you really understand what these things mean, learning a new programming language is pretty trivial conceptually. All you really have to do is learn like the syntax, how it works, because everything really boils down to these big concepts. For example, in a language like Python, there is no static typing. We can do something like this, have one variable set to a number, have another variable set to a string, and we can reassign it. Like we can now set a, change the type, we can set it to a string, but assume I don't do that. What if I try to add these together, a and b? You shouldn't really try adding a number with a string but if you don't know the types we don't we didn't know what these types were we are technically allowed to run this code but when you run it you see we get an error because this is a strongly typed language it doesn't have static types but it does have strong typing now God forbid you try to do the same thing in a language like JavaScript. No static types and weakly typed. So let's give it a try. One plus a string. And you run it and no runtime error. It works. So you'll have a bug when you're not aware of what the types are of certain variables in JavaScript. And there's no strong typing, so you don't even get a runtime error. The program works. It just doesn't work as expected. And that's painful to debug. That's why nowadays nobody really does vanilla javascript people will recommend you use a linter such as typescript and a linter is basically made to inform you about certain errors that can occur at runtime even though the program does technically work but that's not it what i'm talking about goes far beyond just learning about programming languages these things in programming are man-made or human-made it's not an accident that many concepts in programming resemble each other. So in my opinion, when you start seeing things in terms of patterns rather than technical details, you kind of see things from a higher level, you've opened your third eye. You will reach a new level of consciousness like I've gotten to the point where I don't even see code anymore. Like I'm looking at my screen half the day and I can't see the code. Seriously, maybe I need to go to a doctor, but I do see something. I see the webhook pattern. For example, let's say you have a client and it makes a request to some service. Suppose it's a payment related service. It's like Stripe, for example. And the client is going to directly talk with the service. Now, let's say you own both the client and the server. The service, Stripe, is going to respond at some point, either it's success, okay, or there's some failure. And so then you have a choice from the client. You can directly communicate with the server. You can tell it now the status of the event. But we can do something even more intelligent because what if there's an edge case? What if the service responds, but now the client isn't there anymore? The transaction happened, but your server is not aware of it. The webhook pattern is pretty good because not only will this service uh, potentially respond here, but it'll actually send an event to the server. What if the server is down or it can't respond? In many cases, the webhook will do something called a retry. This is pretty good for like fault tolerance. Just because the server was down doesn't mean the event was lost. Now, this isn't exactly the same as certain other patterns, but there are similarities here. The server is notified of an event. This is not so different from the observer pattern in object-oriented programming. It's not that different from the PubSub publisher subscriber pattern in distributed systems where we don't want to lose an event so it can kind of be stored permanently or temporarily somewhere and things can be retried. And there's also this idea of pulling versus pushing. You can kind of see, obviously, when you understand this concept, pull versus push, such a fundamental concept in programming. When you understand it, you see everything in terms of pull versus push. You tell me what's going on over here. Is this pull or push? Obviously, the service is pushing. Now, with PubSub, you can sometimes do both. You can set it up such that things are being pulled or you can set it up such that things are being pushed. It shows up in many places. WebSockets, does it remind you of something? WebSockets are generally push-based. 
Or you can do HTTP polling, see it from a higher level, and then you'll see every time you learn a new concept, people complain, wow, there's like a hundred different things you got to learn to be a software developer. It's true. It's not easy to be a junior. It's not easy to learn programming nowadays. But when you uh, stop seeing things in a low level way and you see it higher, you see actually a lot of these patterns aren't very different. And I'm not even close to done yet. We talked about static typing in programming languages, but this concept applies in many places. Let's talk about APIs. In general, APIs most commonly use JSON format. You tell me, is that statically typed? No, it's JavaScript. It's in the name. It's not statically typed. And that's part of what can make this painful sometimes. But there are alternatives. There are something called protobuf, that's the one I'm most familiar with, but there's many different types of data formats you can send in APIs. Protobufs have something that is similar to static typing. When you receive a protocol buffer, you know what the type is. That's like the whole point of gRPC, at least one of the points. This notion of type safety, and it exists in more than APIs as well. What about databases? You tell me, Look at SQL, a SQL relational database, MySQL, compare it to MongoDB. You tell me which one of these is statically typed and which one of them is similar to like JavaScript objects. This is JavaScript. This is statically typed because you have a schema. You define the type before you can actually insert data. Generally speaking, you can, I think, store JSON in relational databases if you want to. And honestly, I'm not even close to done. I could be here all day telling you about other things that are similar to each other. Like we could talk about asynchronous programming concepts, problems with asynchronous programming show up in many places in databases, in uh, just client side applications. You might get a race condition and so many problems are repeated. And there's a reason because they follow the same pattern, the concept of certain events being executed out of order. And this is, in my opinion, a way to kind of improve from like being a junior to leveling up a little bit. It's not any different than leak code, actually. When you start out solving leak code, every problem is difficult. Every problem teaches you something new. But after a while, you look back, you zoom out, and you realize that many of the problems you solved were actually the exact same problem, just with different words, just with a slightly tweaked solution. But they boil down to the same patterns. That's why patterns are so important with leak code, with distributed systems, with programming languages, literally everything. Unfortunately, I have a poor memory. I I will forget the syntax of a language five minutes after I just learned it, but patterns are pretty difficult to forget.